American tenured faculty at this institution. How many students of color will still transfer out of this institution simply because the campus climate today is threatening? As we think about these things, students, staff, and faculty of color are impacted daily by racism. But most important is the impact of their involvement to addressing these issues in their current status. Thank you. They are often forced to silence simply because they cannot afford to fail academically and lose their positions. Therefore, we stand here today to demand systematic changes. Anyway, what I want to talk about is uh, some of the historical, uh, can I say it, uh, benchmarks at the university. And that is, uh, uh, since the inception of the university, as I know it, from the normal school to the University of Minnesota, Duluth, uh, which I believe took place in about 1949, uh, up until today, no African American has gained tenure at this institution. There's been very little recruitment of African Americans, and those who have come have left very shortly because they understand the climate is not conducive to them achieving their success. We urge the university to change the climate here and, and, be, and recognize that much of the problem uh, are institutional and the people that who have sustained racism uh, in this institution, in spite of the leadership that's come to bring about change, those people are still in place to maintain the status quo. So we expect them to take a deeper look into their ranks and weed out those people who continue to perpetuate racism. And we believe that we talked about uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, first of all, the recruitment process, the interview process. There are no people of color normally, uh, at least, and I can say for African Americans, a part of those processes to make the selection. And for those who are able to, to, to achieve, in spite of that, uh, uh, still do not uh, 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 see the kind of a support system in place. So they, as I said, they either stay long enough until they ask to leave, <coughs> or, or they, uh, or they leave on their own because they recognize the, the condition. What we have had in recent racism, uh, uh, I shouldn't say recent, over the years we had many racial incidents that have taken place here. Those racial incidents that traumatized students who come from uh, 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 well-rounded families, uh, integrated kind of neighborhoods who have not ex been exposed to the kind of racism they experience here at UM UMD. Some of them have been uh, uh, hurt, both psychologically and otherwise, and there are many who quietly left. Their parents came and got them and said, this is not the school that uh, I want my child to go to. We also have had uh, parents who said that based on what they've seen in this community, they don't want their kids raised in this kind of community. And I've had those discussions with those parents who have left out of here and find a job some other place that they believe that their, that their kid would feel have a, a well-rounded experience. So I want to challenge the university, first of all, to look at its, uh, 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 the, the mission statement they have and the core values and make sure that they uh, live up to those and put things in place that, uh, uh, that, that will bring about the change that they talk about. And we want to make sure that African Americans are specifically mentioned in there as one of their uh, one, as part of their vision and part of the goals that they want to achieve. The, the other piece is that I would like to see, uh, we would like to see, that the, uh, that the university, again, create a process that, that everyone can concede that the education is diverse enough that people feel like their culture and their experience is, is included in the educational system that they are, uh, 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 a teaching here, and most people feel like they are not talking, to, they are, that they are not included in there. We talked, uh, uh, Minister Boyd talked about uh, 
forming a partnership with the local community, the African American community, and, and the school district to talk about how we can get more African Americans uh, uh, into the institution and develop a system where they can succeed. No one has talked about the, the barriers that exist here, and, and you, we're not going to get here what those barriers are from the majority community who ma managed it, who may be part of the problem. Okay, and we're gonna, not going to hear from students, the uh, majority of students, who majority of them are succeeding. We want to know, we want them to know from those students who who, uh, who come here, who is experiencing problems, they can tell you what they, the problems that they have, and we need the university administration to listen to what it is they have to say. I'm going to yield right now to uh, the next speaker, uh, which will be uh, Rick DeFoe. Thank you. My name is Ricky DeFoe. I've been a community member here in Duluth, Minnesota for about 35 years of my life. I've attended this institution, uh, University of Minnesota Duluth, in the 80s. Um, I've stood in the past in solidarity with the African-American community. I do so today in solidarity and I'll continue to do so in the future in solidarity with all peoples of color as we uh, fight systemic racism in this community, particularly in the higher learning, the higher schooling at this university, University of Minnesota Duluth. Um, I want to talk about white, uh, whiteness particularly, but also race and a little bit about education. We understand race, we understand education, but do we understand the concept of whiteness? Uh, whiteness is really um, is the same way that a man can be a feminist, uh, so it is that a white can be anti-white. So it is that a person of color can be, go through their whole life in whiteness. Whiteness is a racial concept, it's a, it's a worldview. Um, white people are really the subjects of of that because they get the benefits and the privileges that come with uh, domination and white supremacy. Um, those are some of the things that I wanted to, uh, in whiteness as a whole. And uh, I think the greatest challenge to civil society in terms of race is, is confronting those contours of whiteness. Um, we have here in the culture, in the University of Minnesota Duluth, something that's really been hostile to people of color since, uh, since really since the uh, universities come into existence here in this community. So we see this hostility, we see an extreme tolerance of racist incidents at this university that goes, uh, the, one, the perpetrators are, <clears throat> they do so with impunity. There's nothing that's done so forth to the, the students, the staff, uh, these things in this nature. So we see the extreme tolerance of racist incidents at this institution. It's in the culture that we see in this uh, institution. It's part of their culture. So this is why I talk about uh, whiteness as a, as a policy, as an educational construction of whiteness. And, uh, and it's really a socialized racial system that upholds, reifies, and reinforces the superiority of whites. And uh, we have to understand in which way is U.S. nation uh, created through this educational process, the, really a, a, a white racial quality, if you will. So in, in nation creating through the educational construction of whiteness at this institution, we as a community uh, see these things take shape and form. Now, in order for white racial hegemony to saturate everyday life, it has to be secured by a process of domination. Um, acts and decisions and policies that white subjects uh, perpetuate on people of color. And this happens on an everyday basis here in this institution. These are every, we have been provided with insights into the everyday cognates of a structural system that privileges um, white America. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we talk about from the native perspective, all these incidents that say the, that are tolerated here with the, uh, the smallpox blanket incidents and those things of that nature, we talk about the culture of it. And we, from the community, take a look at what is being co-opted. And we just see the first uh, 
Masters of Tribal Administration here that was uh, graduated their first class uh, last night. And when we think about being co-opted and stuff and we think about whiteness, how does this play a part in the nation building? And we as a native community, are we supposed to accept, uh, be extremely grateful for these small concessions or these privileges when our fundamental equalities are being denied here at this university for all people of color, particularly here today, we, uh, the African-American community here. So we're looking for true equality uh, in all of America. So this is what we talk about nation building and whiteness in this institution. So uh, <clears throat> we have to understand that what we're in, what we're real about, um, uh, what we're faced with here in this institution today. Uh, we can't just uh, purport these things. I think really it has a, a great thing to do with many of the uh, white Americans, some of the allies even. Uh, they, we talk about a, a cognitive dissonance, a psychological dissonance, where you have a conflict with your attitudes and your beliefs. And we see that happening time and time again in this institution here and in, in society as a general. So you, you purport to do some good things, you talk about doing some good things, but you're unable to do, you're unable to do so. Your actions uh, are not that. We from the community take a look at actions and that's what we're doing here today, is direct action. Uh, Mr. Defoe, uh, could, you, uh, could you elaborate on what you mean by token actions, such as... questions right now, sir. So good afternoon, my name is Carl Crawford and as the evening is setting once again on another academic session here at UMD and campus is here in town, once again we have students that their dreams are distinguished by the ugly claws of racism. As community members, we have come to the table many a time, pushed back with a note that says we are going to do better, we are going to work harder, but they have fell on deaf ears. Now, once again, we are standing here today that a document was produced back in 2011 that stated changes were going to be made. And I'm standing here today to show you that those changes have not been made. Those promises have not been kept. So our silence can no longer be kept. We must stand up for our children, for our faculty, for our community members. I want you to know this is not anti-UMD equity and education for everybody. So as we stand here today, the challenge is to look farther and say, you cannot find or, or fix a solution with the problems that helped create it. There must be change. There must be something different. We can no longer allow our kids, our community, to suffer in silence. What's happening in Duluth is, UMD is one of our third largest employers. And what that means is, we have our neighbors that work here. We have our kids that go to school here. We have an educated workforce that is leaving here and they are miseducated because they don't know how and don't understand how to deal with people from different backgrounds and we can no longer allow that to happen. So my ask today is for other communities if you feel the way we do, if you really want to believe in the change, and you really want to see something different in this community, join us and be silent no more. Thank you. My name is Xavier Bell, and my son used to go to this school um, for about two years. And he would tell me stories and tell me stories about his experiences. And finally he said, Dad, I don't know if I need to deal with what's going on here. And I said, we don't. And so we pulled our son from UMD and uh, decided to go elsewhere. I want to speak to you and I want to speak to the nation about a real big concern that we're supposedly addressing, but yet we don't have the heart to address. So let us admit that in order for our schools to be called excellent, exemplary, blue ribbon model schools, we must work for all kinds of diverse learners they must be producing high student outcomes for all learners, regardless of their race, gender, national origin, linguistics, economic status. If they are not, they may be good, but they aren't excellent. 
And after all, good schools have always worked for some students, but the real issue is making the schools work for all students. So what's the problem? The debates in Minnesota are persistent around the gap and around education and outcomes, but we sometimes miss the basic truth. The current education system is not working well enough for kids of color and economically disadvantaged young people. Racially and economically predicted disparities are the outcome. What does it matter? Minnesota population school has changed drastically over the last two decades, and youth of color are the fastest growing segment of the population who are spending their money in this institution. But education policies and practices have not changed, changed to serve the diverse student population. That's a serious problem. And disparities run deep, not only in this institution, but in our community as a whole. We can develop solutions by closing the gap, we can build leaders. We can help have multiple community engagement strategies to address concerns around education, but miss the point of true engagement, which primarily is being able to allow people from all backgrounds to have a stake and an investment in our community and to feel valued and welcome. And if at the end of the day, at the end of that engagement, that our students and our kids and our community don't feel welcome, we have a problem. So we're bringing you to account. We're, in, we're employing on the nation, we're calling upon the nation to not only address the concerns that we're doing, trying to address, but and provide us an opportunity to emphasize society's role in affording a fair chance to everybody, but not starting conversations here in futility but honestly starting conversations within the scope of our humanity and work towards change. Because we won't settle for anything else but change. Equitable change to assist these students in being successful. And we're going to need to learn how to compete in a world that values inclusion and diversity. And if we don't figure that out, we will be left behind. So I want to thank you for your time. We want to thank the press and we want to thank everyone here in support. Please support the students at UMD. That's what we're asking you to do. Faculty, staff who value inclusion and diversity, please do that. Make your voices heard and don't sit in obscurity thinking that somebody else will do it. We're the change we've been waiting for. All right. I, I want to say that uh, this, is, this, boy, this is the first time that we have come together to address issues here at the university. It is not the last time. We expect to be at the deck tomorrow at graduation and uh, to show our presence there and our concerns at, the, at graduation tomorrow. So uh, again, we'll let, notify you when we want to, to, to come back here at the university and express our concerns and give you any progress that we may have uh, uh, see going and happening here at the university. Again, thank you. Mr. Washington, yes. do you have any action steps beyond the action at the graduation tomorrow? I think that you just have to be there. I didn't hear the answer. You just have to be there. Okay. We're not going to tell you what's going to happen. You just be there and see for yourself. And if you can, if you can't, that's okay. Thank you.